Bellingcat at the moment as an organization, it's a NGO based in the Netherlands. We have about 30 staff members. We work on a variety of topics. Obviously at the moment, a lot of it is the conflict in Ukraine. We do a lot of work on justice and accountability. So examining how we can use open source information in legal accountability. Um, but that wasn't really where I began. When I began um, my career in open source investigation 10 years ago, I was just working an office job and spending too much time on the internet. In particular, the Guardian Middle East Live blog arguing in the comments with people about videos coming off the internet. I had no vision of what I would be doing in the future. I was just working an office job arguing with people. And among those arguments were, you know, how can we trust the videos coming from this conflict? And that's a reasonable question, I thought. And I also really wanted to win the arguments I was having. So. I realized that I could start looking at videos like this. This is uh, from TG in Libya, supposedly, shared by a rebel group who had captured the town. And this was uh, back in 2011 on one day, a topic of debate on an internet comment section somewhere that I was part of. But people are saying, how do you know this is the place it was filmed? And this is actually one of the first videos I ever did something called geolocation with. And geolocation is confirming the location of a video or photograph based off what we can see in the video. Um, often people think of things like metadata where they might have coordinates or other information, but with social media, that information is generally stripped. So all you have is the video itself. So I was looking at this and I could see there was this mosque with a dome and a minaret and it was next to a road. It had you know two lanes. It was pretty wide because the tank could fit down it and it had a central divider. So I thought, well, where can I find the images of this place? Well, Google Maps. So. I was able to go to the location in question, TG, see this road running through the center of it. I could see it was split into two lanes with very, very clear um, uh, with the cars visible there. And moving down the road, I was able to come across this building, which is a mosque with a dome and a minaret. Now, that wasn't enough to say it was exactly the same location because there's plenty of mosques with domes and minarets next to roads in the world. So first of all, I could establish the approximate camera position. I'm going to press this button hoping it's a laser. So if my presentation turns off, I do apologize. Ah, there we go. Uh, so the camera position is approximately there. And we can tell that because here we have the minaret catching a, casting a shadow there. You can see it's on the left hand side of the image here and the dome there is on the right hand side. So that gives us an approximate camera position. But then we can kind of, kind of drill down and look at some of the smaller details. So we can see, for example, this discoloration in the road as it turns here. We can see things like this utility poles casting shadows. So what you do is you start with the kind of larger objects that allow you to narrow down the possible locations. And then you, go, you find that a possible location and start looking at the smaller details, the background details, make sure buildings are in the same positions. And this is a very simple version of geolocation, but I didn't even have a word for this. This was just winning arguments on the internet for me at that point. So I decided to start a blog, which I named after a Frank Zappa song I was listening to at the time, uh, quite randomly. Um, and I basically just wrote things that were interesting to me. It wasn't about me trying to make a political point. It wasn't about me trying to, you know, change anyone's mind. It was really a hobby where I could, you know, put my thoughts down, do some of these things more extensively rather than just posting on Twitter about it, write it down. But this actually then became um, something that became increasingly popular among people who were looking at the conflict in Syria. Because in 2012, no one was really looking at these videos coming from the conflict in any kind of systematic way. What you really had was a very small group of people on the internet, really a dozen people from various jobs. There was someone from Amnesty International, a couple of people from Storyful, which is a Dublin-based media organization that verifies videos. Um, some people from Human Rights Watch, a journalist here or there, people from mainly the kind of journalism and human rights sector. Um, but we kind of came together and just got to know each other on the internet and we'd find interesting videos and talk about them and try and figure out what they were. But throughout that process, I started finding more and more interesting stuff. And one of the first things I started doing is following an event called the Hula Massacre in 2012, I realized different towns and cities and regions in Syria had their own media centers. Rather than everyone using the internet, you generally just had groups of people who came together to post something stuff online. And you could find those YouTube channels and catalog them and 
I've gathered over the two years about a thousand YouTube channels that I would just watch, see what videos were coming out of them every single day and find interesting stuff. So some of that stuff was like this. This is a screenshot from the first ever video that showed the remains of cluster munitions. So until then, there was no evidence of cluster munition use in the conflict. But I came across this video. By, when I found it, 10 people had watched the video. And um, that was then shared with Human Rights Watch and you know, shown as the first use of cluster munitions. And this was actually something I used these videos to track the escalation of the use of cluster munitions. Because after this video, there was actually like a four month period where there were no more cluster munition videos. And then all of a sudden there were loads of them. So you could actually see the kind of ebb and flow of munition use. Um, this is actually a first ever video of a barrel bomb. Um, which is an improvised explosive device dropped from helicopters. Now, you look at that, and that doesn't look like much. That looks like someone's pushed over a bin full of dirt. So there's a lot of cynicism about it. So we started looking into some of these incidents. There was cynicism from the likes of Russia Today, who called it barrel bomb baloney, saying, why would a professional air force use anything like this? Completely ridiculous. But by systematically reviewing those videos every single day, they started coming out interesting footage like this one. This is a um, helicopter, a transport helicopter, and just at this moment, you see something push from the rear of the helicopter. So this gave us our first kind of clue of what the delivery method of these were. Um, then this video was published. Um, it was supposedly taking off the phone of a, uh, a captured or killed soldier, and this actually shows a barrel bomb being pushed out of the helicopter. So it's basically just a metal tube stuffed with explosives with a wick fuse that's lit with a cigarette in this case and pushed out. Of course, the reaction to that is, well, how do you know this is Syria? But there's a really big clue here because we have this top down view of a town in Syria and a researcher for Human Rights Watch spent a very long time looking at satellite imagery and was actually able to find the exact location that it was taken in this location here. And we can be sure of that because if we rotate the image, we can actually do a side-by-side -side comparison of the video and the location and fill it almost like a fingerprint to say, yes, this is definitely somewhere in Syria. So this is what I would describe at a minimum what you have to do with any video footage from any conflict zone. You need to be able to prove where it was filmed through geolocation, and that became a kind of core methodology. But this is still back in 2012, and I'm just blogging, and no one's really taking any notice of this work. Um, but... I started discovering these videos where very unusual weapons started appearing. Now, this is early 2013. I'd spent a year at that point cataloging every weapon I could find in the conflict. The reason I was focused on weaponry is because I don't speak Arabic, so I had no idea what these people were saying, but I could see what they were driving around and carrying, and no one else was really bothering to look at that stuff. They were just kind of, oh, the rebels have weapons, so there's a war. But it's this weapon that actually revealed something very interesting. This is an RBG-6 multiple grenade launcher. Uh, it originates from uh, Croatia in the form of Yugoslavia. They have three other weapons that appeared alongside it. The M60 recallless gun, um, the M79 officer rocket launcher, and an RPG-22. And these are all weapons that had connections to the same region. And I started digging through these videos and I, I catalogued them, I had a spreadsheet, I was figuring out which group was, had them, and these were all groups who were connected to uh, a, basically a group of countries known as the Friends of Syria. So these are um, various countries in the uh, Middle East uh, and in the West. And I shared this with a um, New York Times journalist I was speaking to at the time, and he took those videos away, away and showed them to U.S. officials. And they basically said, oh, this is uh, videos of a secret Saudi smuggling operation through Jordan and arming the Syrian rebels. Now, there had been lots of rumors and claims that these weapons had been provided or some weapons were being provided, but no actual evidence. And I had actually managed to find the evidence on the social media pages of the groups who were receiving them. These were all from YouTube videos and Facebook posts. Um, and that led to a uh, front page story on the New York Times, which for me really elevated my status from some random blogger to someone who was exposing kind of secret um, smuggling operations. And because of that, that then allowed me to, um, well, I had, a, I had the Guardian come to my house and do an interview with me, which was really weird. So I had to explain what Brown Roses was and stuff like that. The following week, I had five different news crews coming to my house and parking their vans outside my little terrace house in Odeby. So I had like CNN with a big satellite dish, cables running into my house and everyone looking out the windows wondering what the hell was going on. 
Um, but this then led to me doing kind of more events, meeting people and going from just some blogger in their front room on their sofa to someone who's actually, you know, talking to journalists and people on a regular occasion. Um, but then the August 21st sound attacks came along in 2013. And this was another really big moment for me because there were very unusual weapons used in these attacks. No one had really seen these before. And what you've got here is the remains of a um, what's known as a volcano rocket. But no one knew what these were before August 21st, 2013. And this is the rocket motor. And this section here is what contains the chemical agent, which was sarin. And these are bits of metal from that detonating. Now, we didn't know any of this. We had to figure this out. And in particular, it was uh, came down to me because I was the only person who every single day for the last 18 months had been watching videos from Syria and had actually seen these used before in other alleged chemical attacks that no one took any notice of because not enough people died and it didn't make it into the evening news. So um, activists on the ground in Syria reached out to me and they said, is there any way to help? And I said, if you see any of these, take some photos. What they actually did is they um, took one and drug it, dragged it through the streets home and put it on Skype for me which I said, please don't carry chemical weapons into your house. And they were like, it's fine, we're keeping it on the balcony, it's perfectly safe. <laughs> so working with Human Rights Watch, um, these, were, these ones with the measuring tapes are the photographs they sent me of them measuring it. So we actually had the most detailed information possible about the munition that we were able to use to reconstruct it. For example, little details like this, these holes here, that's a fuse port and that's a filling cap. And we know that because I got them to take close up photos of the filling cap and you know, demonstrate what it is. So we understood it was a liquid fill. Um, there are various other details that we discovered, but we were able to kind of demonstrate before anyone else what this munition actually looked like and how it would operate. Um, and this was a really big moment because no one else in the world was able to do that. And me, a blogger, was able to do that with photos and videos from social media. Um, and that, again, kind of wrote, created a kind of greater profile for me. It started getting more and more journalists and people working in human rights groups more and more interested in this kind of content. Um, and it became a really big part of what I was doing. So in 2014, I decided to uh, launch a new website, Bellingcat, and it had two goals. One was to give people a place if they wanted to send an article to have it published. And the other was um, to provide case studies and guides on teaching people how to do it themselves. Very small goals. I raised about £60,000 or £50,000 on Kickstarter. Um, but I launched it on July 14, 2014. And three days later, MH17 was shot down in eastern Ukraine. And that became a massive catalyst, not only for my own work in Bellingcat, but the entire kind of open source movement, really. Um, and what happened on that day is people on social media came together and started talking about the videos and photographs and the stuff that was being shared. In particular, images of like this that shows a book missile launcher uh, on the back of a low loader. And a guy called Eric Toller, who'd been following my work for a couple of years um, and knew me from arguing with people on the internet, he um, decided to figure out if he could geolocate this. And he did that by looking at this shop sign because you can't really read that too clearly, but he understood that there was only so many words it could be in um, the local language. And he Googled that word along with the name of the town it was supposedly in. Um, what that provided him is with is this wiki. And this wiki just lists streets in the eastern Ukraine with what shops are on their streets. And that shop there, this laser there, is the shopping question he's looking for. And that's basically 50 years of the USSR street in a town called Torres. So he took the name of the street, the name of the shop, put it back into Google and found another result. This is basically from a um, legal um, document about a fight that took place in that shop that gives the full address of the shop. Um, so this allows us to go to the exact location. So the camera is basically here pointing in this direction and here's the shop and the missile launchers here. Um, but there was another piece of information we could use to confirm 100% it was the correct location because we like to have as much kind of um, fidelity in a sense of uh, with the RGO location. So if you remember the yellow hoarding on the shop sign and this building over here with the stripes and the billboard running down the center of it, um, some people have very strange hobbies on the internet. 
I mean, that's fine. You can do what you want. It's your life. But there's one guy in eastern Ukraine who drives around filming stuff on this dashboard camera and then posts the video on YouTube with all the lists of the streets he's been driving down. So when we search for the street name, it came up in the results. You can see the buildings here. He, in fact, actually had been down the same road on two different occasions. So this almost provided us with our own Google Street View from this guy and his YouTube videos. Um, so, and because these videos are about 20 minutes long each, we can be really sure, we can basically geolocate the entire route if we wanted to. So we had journalists on the ground who actually went to the same location and recreated the photograph. And what I started seeing, especially with um, this incident, is we would do kind of an investigation, geolocate something, and then journalists on the ground would go out and actually go to the location, speak to witnesses, and gather a bit more information that would then kind of feed back into what we were doing. So we had this kind of nice little information loop going with them. So using these videos and photographs, the first thing we were able to do is geolocate every single video of this low loader and eventually the book missile launcher moving under its own power through eastern Ukraine on July 17th, 2014. What will, in a much longer presentation that I'm not doing today, what we were able to do was also geolocate a convoy inside Russia that was traveling from a missile brigade to the border of Ukraine a few weeks earlier. Within that, there was one missile launcher that had damage and markings on it identical to the one that was seen on July 17th in Ukraine. So we were able to first establish the missile launcher had come from Russia originally. We were then able to find the missile base it came to, from, find the social media page of the um, missile base, find all the soldiers who were following the social media page, and then use all their social media profiles to completely reconstruct the entire unit with names, faces, and the people who are inside that convoy, including the commanders of all the Buck missile launches in the convoy. And this was all done through publicly available information, but it was really the first time anyone had done that on that kind of scale. And as a result, we were able to sh prove not only where the missile launcher came from, which brigade it, it was provided by, but the fact that it was also almost certainly crewed by Russians, not separatists, as some people were claiming. And this was at a time a massive amount of disinformation coming from Russia, making all kinds of claims and counterclaims, often contradicting itself. But we were able to use, with open source evidence, this information to really give a clear picture of what was going on. Um, in fact, as a result of what we did, Russia passed a law to make it illegal for servicemen to share images of their service at any point in time. So then banned from sharing stuff on social media at the moment because of the work of Banning Cat piecing them apart. It didn't really stop them, but you know, it, it's there. Um, but we can use open source for a whole variety of different things and very importantly, crowdsourcing as well. So this is a journalist from the BBC who shared this video. It's about, a, he had heard from a, friend of a friend, a family had gone missing in the British Virgin Islands as Hurricane Irma had hit the, built, the island. The problem was they'd just moved house, they hadn't given anyone their new address, and no one knew where they actually were in the British Virgin Islands, and they'd been missing for two days with their children. So using this video, he was wondering if anyone could geolocate exactly where it was filmed. So this is all the information we had, British Virgin Islands and this video. So using this information, we were able to geolocate it, and it was partly through crowdsourcing. One thing you can do on Google Earth is you can go down and look at the terrain on the ground, what it looks like. There's a 3D model of the world, including height maps. And these islands in the distance allowed people to basically go around the outside of the British Virgin Islands, looking outwards to the sea, until they actually found a location where they could see that same view, which is from approximately this area, pointing out to sea, where you can see these islands, and these islands have approximately the same shape. We then use this platform called EchoSec, and this allows you to do searches of geofence social media posts, and it allowed us to find this view from the same road, download a really nice high resolution copy of it, and then use this image here to compare to the image that we had from the video. And as you can see, that's a very close match. Now, we, this didn't tell us where the house was, though. It told us the approximate location, so we then had to narrow down. There are a few details that stood out here. For example, there's this kind of banister and this kind of wooden roof with these wedge shapes. We have this kind of wooden handrail that's below it as well. And we were able to use that to narrow down which house it came from. First of all, we looked at these three populated areas on this side of the coast. Um, one of them is this area called Pockwood Pond on the west side, which is an industrial estate, and you can look at all the buildings and see warehouses and stuff. Here, the boats in the foreground would have been visible. 
So it narrowed it down to this one location. If we zoom in, we can say, see that the, there's swimming pools, cars parked in driveways, it's residential properties. The problem is there weren't many photographs in that area, not geotags, there were no street view. So I thought, how am I gonna get photographs of the inside of these houses to look at their you know, banisters and stuff like that? Airbnb and estate agents. <laughs> if you ever want to look into someone's house, it, it's brilliant. So I eventually, searching through every single site, found this place. And it had lots and lots of photographs where I could see a very similar style uh, of design in various locations throughout. And you can also see the roof is very similar in style. The problem was, this had lots of lovely views, you know, in the photographs of the villa because they're trying to sell it and they're trying to sell it for the views. And none of those views matched what I could see in the video. And I looked at all the houses in the area and nearly every single one of them was unique. They had different designs. They, none of them matched this. Um, and this here gives you a sense of kind of the, the land. This is the house in question. This is the land it's on. And I realized that the house next to it, unlike all the other houses in the area, had a very similar layout, it had an additional swimming pool, but it was very similar. So we got in contact with the landlord or the estate agent who sold this house, and he had just sold this house to a British family who'd been evacuated a few days earlier, and it turned out to be the missing British family. And through crowdsourcing and looking for all this data, it took about an hour to do that. So you can do this stuff very, very rapidly. Um, even more rapidly was the time we looked into ISIS supporters in Europe because um, ISIS telegram channels had encouraged their supporters to, um, they were about to release a new message from their spokesperson and they had a hashtag for it. Um, and they had encouraged their supporters to write the hashtag down, hold a piece of paper and say where they were in Europe to give the impression that there are ISIS supporters <coughs> everywhere in the world. You couldn't hide from us. Now, this left-hand image is a bunch of leaves and therefore is not geolocatable. The middle one is inside a shop. I think if you spend enough years working on it, you might be able to find it. You can see the kind of quality streets up there, but you know, that's not gonna tell you too much. But this one on the right-hand side is very geolocatable. And it's in um, Munster in Germany. And you can see various things. There's the bus, there's cars, there's traffic lights, but the clue is the advertising pole because in Germany, they list all the advertising locations on a website. And you can go to Munster, you can select the advertising polls, and it will show you every single location that's available. And you can then look at those locations and look at the, uh, them on aerial imagery. What's great about Munster as well is rather than standard kind of lower resolution satellite imagery, they've actually used aircraft to take the whole area. So you get this wonderfully high resolution imagery. And then it's just a process of going through one by one, matching off the ones that could be likely locations and eventually this location was found and the cameras on the top right corner facing down to the bottom left we can see for example the advertising poles very clearly stood there but then because this is really nice resolution imagery we can look at smaller and smaller details so for example the railings just behind it are visible the road markings are visible and importantly are in the right position and they have the thick line on the left and the dotted line on the right so that fits the camera position and you have traffic lights and other details this picture was geolocated i shared it on twitter saying can anyone geolocate it and someone had a location in 10 minutes so you can do it extremely rapidly and there were four photographs in particular um, from france germany london and the netherlands that were all geolocated within about 10 minutes so, so Elliot, this stuff is too subtle for ai and machine learning to pick up right? yeah i mean i yeah. I really think, I mean, some people think, oh, maybe you can do this with machine learning, but I just don't think it's there's so many tiny details sometimes yeah. that you come across. But this was done very rapidly and um, the police were informed about this. And three of those four suspects were arrested and had um, plans they were making um, and it pre possibly prevented some quite nasty stuff from happening. So that's just, but that's again, crowdsourcing. Let's bring people together, getting them to work on something. Now, Another time we crowd saw something was when um, Russia started bombing Syria in 2015. So in September 2015, Russia started bombing Syria, claiming they were only going after ISIS. It was all about ISIS and no one else. And when people started saying that's not true because we can see you're not doing that, 
we had Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, saying, do not listen to the Pentagon about Russian airstrikes, ask the Russian Ministry of Defense. And in a way, that's what we did, because Russia had started publishing videos like this on YouTube, showing gun cam reviews of their various uh, bombings. And they claimed this was an ISIS facility. You can actually see those are grain silos they're bombing, not an ISIS facility. Um, but they had lots and lots of these videos. In the two-month period, they published around 100 videos. So a group of people on Twitter, and they still do this today with other videos, started geolocating these videos. And it's very similar to what we did with the bow bombing video earlier. Basically a game of spot the difference between these videos and Google Earth. And we, I saw that they were doing this and I reached out to them and we started doing it in a systematic way. We had a spreadsheet, we filled it in once it was geolocated, we double checked stuff. And we discovered that in the first 30 bombings that ISIS would claim to be the target, only one of those was actually in territory controlled by ISIS. And how do we know the territory is controlled by ISIS? Well, again, we asked the Russian Ministry of Defense because they helpfully provided this map of who controlled what. And we then overlaid that in Google Earth, basically removed the map, but we kept the territory um, nice and clear like this. So it meant as soon as we geolocated a video, we could immediately see if according to the Russians, it was in ISIS controlled territory. And this is one example of a video. This was reportedly in the YouTube description Russia published. It was a ISIS facility being bombed. Um, and again, this was geolocated. And you can see it's zooming in miles away from ISIS controlled territory. And it's actually here. And this isn't an, uh, isn't an ISIS facility. It's a bakery. Um, this is also an interesting thing about these videos. They were publishing videos showing them targeting civilian infrastructure, bombing bakeries, grain silos, all kinds of stuff, and hoping no one would notice and saying these are ISIS facilities. Ah, ah, ah. Um, so, and this is something Russia, Russia lies constantly, often for no good reason. It's just so ingrained in the way they communicate. It's like anything you see Russia saying, you need to fact check because it's almost going to turn out to be false. I actually encourage people, if you want to learn how to do open source investigation, fact check Russian Ministry of Defense statements because you'll find some lie there somewhere. Um, in this case, this was a really unusual event. So a few years ago, there was a coup in Turkey uh, or an attempted coup in Turkey, and um, it didn't really stick. And the following day, a journalist in Turkey published this video. And this is what he claimed to be a WhatsApp conversation between some of the plotters of the coup during the actual coup taking place. And it's a very long conversation. It's in Turkish. Um, so my colleague, uh, Christian Treibert, who was uh, volunteering with us at the time, he took it upon himself to translate the entire conversation. Um, but he didn't know Turkish, so he tried to crowdsource it. Uh, in this document. It was a complete disaster. No one could decide, agree among themselves, what words meant specifically, even though it wasn't that hard to do, but everyone just argued about it. Eventually, one um, native Turkish speaker who knew English said, I'll, I'll do it for you, and started putting it together. And that gave us basically a, uh, the entire evening, supposedly from the perspective of the coup plotters. The thing is, that's too good to be true. If you see that, you can say that can't possibly be true. So what we wanted to check is, is this stuff they're saying in this conversation matchable to stuff happening that we can see through open sources? Now, one of the first things that happened is they started talking about the um, bridges being blocked. Now, if you know Istanbul, you know that the um, Istanbul is basically split by the Bosphorus and there's two bridges. There's now a third one, but two bridges that divide the city. So if you control that, you basically split the city into. It's very tactically, tactically advantageous. And we could see social media posts like this one uh, at the same time as they were talking about the things being blocked. The thing is that everyone knew that happened. That wasn't something that no one knew was happening. You could easily fake that. So it was an okay start, but it wasn't enough to say this conversation was genuine. So we started looking at some of the other details within this conversation. So one of them says 66 is on its way to which someone else replies, 212 has been passed. But what's 66 and 212? We didn't know, so we tried to start figuring this out. Now, 66 is on its way. Could it be a military unit, was our guess. Um, so is there a 66 military unit? Well, one thing we noticed is lots of the vehicles had number plates beginning 117 in certain parts of Istanbul. So we decided to figure out what these meant. Now, again, people have weird hobbies on the internet. 
one of which is um, collecting number plates. And there's a worldlicenseplates.com has people who do this as a hobby. So we discovered the details of the number plates and that 117 belonged to a specific military unit, the 66th Mechanized Infantry Brigade. So we had our 66, but what does 212 mean? This is actually the website of the 66 that had lots of useful photographs of it. Um, so 212 has been passed. Well, what Christian did was something quite simple. He went to Google and typed in 212 Istanbul and saw what the results were. And it took him to the 212 Istanbul Para outlet. And in fact, if you zoom into it, you can even see 212 is written on the roof of the building. So this was kind of, you know, could this be the location? He used um, EchoSec again. Allowed, he searched the area for social media posts made around the same time that this um, message was sent. And there were lots and lots of social media posts of different sorts. And he discovered photos like this and several photographs where it was actually possible to see the number plates with 117 on it, showing it was the 66. Then he started going through all the information that was published afterwards about the people who were involved with the coup and started matching off the various names of at different ranks to people in the group. Um, and this allowed us to establish which of the land forces were involved with the coup and in the conversation. There was a big moment on the evening where um, Erdogan um, got on WhatsApp himself and started um, talking to a presenter at CNN Turk and told everyone to get out onto the streets. I was actually in Turkey at the time when this was happening. It's a very strange night. Um, then we started having the coup plotters deciding that they wanted to get a bit more aggressive. So crush them, burn them, no compromise. And then his friend saying, oh, come on, you don't do that. So they were discussing various, they were like saying, well, we can't really do that anyway, because we won't be able to stop them anyway, because so many people are in the streets. So they're trying to react to that. And the thing is, this was getting to the point now where we, their conversation was clearly matching up to events on the ground as they were unfolding. This guy here walking down the stairs with various people, um, he was basically a coup plotter who gave up. And we identified him and he actually left the conversation moments before this event took place. We also had um, other stuff like this. So various responses to people, kind of the soldiers panicking, getting worried, more and more people coming out on the streets. Um, this was a very useful moment because um, this is a presenter who was at Taksim Square and they flew over aircraft at a low altitude to scare people. Um, and at that same moment in the conversation, they re really refer to the planes flying over Taksim Square. So more and more, we had events like this, where they were talking about, could we consider an air assault on the bridge to get rid of the protesters? And then it all came to an end. Someone says, has the operation been cancelled? Yes, Commander. We're quitting. Yes, quit Commander, meaning yes, the operation is aborted. Shall we escape? So this is the end of their conversation as they realise the game's up. So this is a fairly key thing. Stay alive, Commander. The choice is yours. We have not decided yet, but we have left our position. I'm closing the group. Delete the message if you want. Obviously, they forgot to delete the messages, which meant that we could reconstruct the entire evening and confirm that this conversation was legitimate. Um, for that, uh, we, were, we won the European Press Prize. It was um, one of our kind of biggest publications that year. Um, Christian ended up going to work with the New York Times at their visual investigation team and winning one or two Pulitzer Prizes with them. I can't remember how many it is now. Um, we've also done a lot of work on the far right in Europe and elsewhere. Um, there's one incident in particular um, during the um, far right rally, uh, which famously had the tiki torches a few years ago in 2017 where one photograph came out of it where this guy was assaulting the guy on the ground. Now, could we figure out who this person was? What we did is we gathered every video and photograph coming from any possible source we could find and just create this huge collection of videos and photographs. It's actually something we did with the um, January 6th uh, event. Uh, we gathered over a thousand videos there and I spent about four weeks piecing them all together for a piece we did with NBC News. But this is where we first came up with the idea because we were able to find a guy who looked very similar to him in some of the videos. And you can see he's got his own um, customized helmet. He's wearing a similar shirt. The stickers on the helmet, even though it's blurry here, they're very clearly similar shapes in the same positions. So this seemed very likely to be the same person. 
But who is this person? We don't know his name. So we started looking at various um, other photographs, seeing if there was anyone he might be hanging out with. So we found this photograph. We can actually see it's the same guy. How can we tell it's the same guy? Well, he has the same moles on his neck, so we can be sure it's the same person. Often when we're doing a kind of facial comparison, what we're looking for is that kind of level of detail. It's not enough to say they look similar. We want kind of the moles, the blemishes, the scars, those details to be 100% sure. Often it's about, in a way, it's kind of what we did with the TG video. We start with something big and narrow it down to smaller and smaller details till we're sure. Uh, we can also see as well, he's wearing the same shirt and the same chain, his ears the same shape. Those kind of little details of what we're looking for. But it still didn't tell us who this person is. But we thought, well, you know, if you're going to march, you know, with your friends somewhere and you know, be racist, surely you're going to go with your friends. So can we find out who these people are? Fortunately, an account called Yes, You're Racist had already identified two of the people in this photograph. And they show profiles on social media. So we looked up their social media profiles. So this is one of them, Jacob Dix. And he uh, was clearly the same person from the photographs. Again, we matched that off. And even more usefully, Ryan Martin had very distinctive neck tattoos that allowed us to be sure it was him. Now, could we connect him to the person in the photograph? Well, we looked at um, the friends list of Ryan and he didn't list his friends. He was very security conscious. Fortunately, um, Ryan was friends with Jacob. So we started looking for Jack Jacob's friends list and found lots of people, including this guy, Dan Bockborden, as he describes himself. And we started looking through his photos. We could see he was friends with Jacob and he was also friends with Ryan. Because even though Ryan had his friends list private, Dan didn't. So we're able to find photographs of him. And again, it's the moles on his neck and the chains and all the stuff that gives him away. So we're able to find his actual identity and confirm he was the person in the video. And eventually this led him to being convicted for several years um which you can see in this photograph and he was convicted for the assault that he committed and he was identified through digging through those social media posts so it has you know a big impact um and just going back to crowdsourcing again one um really large-scale crowdsourcing things we've been doing is helping europol with their tracing objects stop child abuse campaign um, because they've been asking members of the public if they can identify these objects taken from abuse imagery. And because these are individual objects, it's something where we realise we could just t ask our followers, do you know what these are? Because it's really down to having that kind of knowing what that object is rather than any kind of specific research knowledge. And they started being able to identify these objects. Um, one of the most um, I found impressive examples of this is a hotel room. So this is an original image, a blank stuff out. This was any hotel or room anywhere in the world. That was all the information we had. And I think it took less than 24 hours for someone to come across it in the post we were sharing and say, I've been to that hotel and this right hand photograph is actually from the hotel website. And even though the bed sheets have changed, it's the same room. And again, that was able to, we were able to confirm where that photograph was taken. And this has been very useful for Europol. They've managed to arrest people based off this. They've even saved children based off this. And identified various people involved the chain of abuse based off this work. So what is really just us showing photographs and saying, hey, does anyone know what this is? Has you know, been responsible for those kind of kids being saved and those people being prosecuted. Now, I kind of have a theory about crowdsourcing. One thing you may have heard of is the Boston Marathon bombing Reddit investigation, which was an absolute disaster. Because what happened is you had too many people looking at a very complex investigation. And that is kind of leads to groupthink. Basically, everyone gets an idea in their head, and then anyone with a, you know, who disagrees just gets pushed to the side. And this led to Reddit identifying people who were not involved with the, the bombing and had actually already um, one of them was dead. Um, and it caused a lot of trauma for the family involved because these people were being falsely accused and it's because lots of people came together on the internet to figure something out. On the other side of the line of success is the zone of ignorance, as I like to call it, where you don't have enough information. Like with the Trace and Object Stop Child Abuse campaign, if it was just two or three people looking at those images, you wouldn't find what these objects were. If you share it with as many people as possible, you get lots of people doing it. So the more complex a topic is, the smaller the number of people you want working with it, 
the simpler the question is, the larger. So things like geolocation, what is this object, those things are great for sharing with lots of people. And that's what we do at Bellingcat. We use that to um, find out information. And one thing we've been doing with the conflict in Ukraine is um, basically drawing from that online community of people geolocating videos and turning it into a data set of civilian harm based off geolocated social media posts. So if you go to ukraine.bellingcat.com, you basically have an interactive map of I think over a thousand incidents of civilian casualties, all coming from social media posts that have been geolocated. You can actually download it as well if you want to look at the data set and do fun visualizations with it yourself. This is kind of the first stage of what we're doing with our work on Ukraine. As I said before, Bellingcat is very heavily involved with accountability at the moment. This data here is being provided along with other information to various accountability processes. And the next stage of that is something that's more in depth. Uh, a few years ago, we started something called the Yemen Project, where we developed a process with the Global Legal Action Network that is specifically designed for open source evidence to be used in a courtroom. And it's a process that allows us to archive material, make sure everything's forensically archived, um, actually preserve the investigation process itself and answer questions that address everything that we brought in a courtroom. It's also very specifically only based off our open source information, because once you start dealing with witness statements and gathering evidence, that creates complexities around chain of custody that we aren't equipped to work with. But from the open source evidence, we can present what information we know from that, and then that can be provided to organizations who then combine that with other information and these are the kind of investigations that again we'll be providing to accountability processes um, and other investigative processes to do with ukraine um, and i think that's it that's spelling cats